He had discovered that there were hypocrites among the people that now needed to be exposed. The master of them and their head's name was Abdullah ibn Salul. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings to the Prophet the names of the hypocrites who are amongst them. We're going to have to deal with them. And he is now going to expose them in front of all the Muslims and exile them, tell them to get out. So he stood up in the member of the mosque. He immediately went to name the names of the hypocrites. So and so, and so and so, and so and so, and so and so, by name. And there were about something close to 70 of them. And they all had to get up in front of everyone and said, leave the masjid, leave this town, don't come back. They even had the opportunity to repent, but they didn't. One of them, as he was getting out, a sahabi was coming in and he said, where are you going? He said, the messenger of Allah has exposed me as one of the hypocrites. And he said, may Allah curse you. And truly they left. The only man he did not say his name was, guess who? The leader of all the hypocrites, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Sadud. Why? Because... The greatest humiliation to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul was about to come. He doesn't need to say his name, but he is going to suffer by default, naturally. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul started this, and he will suffer from his own hands without even needing to be exposed. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, truly it happened to him. All the hypocrites have been exposed. I've got no supporters. I've got no people around me. They've all left me. They left him. They can't help him anymore. They said, we've been exposed, you're on your own. And so Abdullah ibn Ubayy Salul was left to die a lonely, miserable man. As a result, he got depressed and sick. And the end of Abdullah ibn Ubayy Salul, the leader of the hypocrites, was as follows. He got sick out of depression and anxiety and stress. And as he was dying, he called upon the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet, peace be upon him, went to visit him. And he was saying, where are my allies of the Jews? They all abandoned me. And the Prophet ﷺ looks at him angrily, saying, until now, Ya Abdullah, no time for you to repent, you're still remembering the enemies of Islam who betrayed you? So then Abdullah looks at him and he, goes, and he tries to change the word around. He says, look, Ya Rasulullah, it's time of death, I'm dying. So just let it go and don't hold it on to me. I've got one request. Please wrap me up with your clothes when I die and pray Salat al Janazah on me. Will you do that? The Prophet ﷺ said, I will do that. Why? Because he is Rahmatan lil Alameen, the mercy to all mankind. He still was hoping that maybe Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul will repent before his death. However, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul died. And the Prophet ﷺ did not know whether he had converted or not or repented, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did expose in the first parts of the verses in the Quran, saying these are the signs of the hypocrites, and he started counting them to the point where all the Muslims approximately started to know and pick Abdullah ibn Ubay as being a hypocrite, because all the signs were there. But the Prophet ﷺ chose to what? To still interpret and assume about him good. The guy died. And the Prophet ﷺ fulfilled his promise. He goes up to him when he is dead on his bed, and the Prophet ﷺ starts praying Salat al Janazah on him once, twice. And Umar radiallahu anhu, because he's a tough, you know, he's a man of just black and white, he comes up and very vocally says to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, do not pray on him. He is a munafiq, he is a hypocrite. Ya Rasulullah, Allah has exposed him. Look at all these signs. He cannot be anything but a hypocrite. Don't pray on him. Don't make istighfar for him. And the Prophet ﷺ says to Umar, Go away from me, Ya Umar. I will make istighfar for him 70 times if it need be until Allah forgives him. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the verse, Ayah 80 in chapter number 9 in Surah at tawbah Allah said, Whether you ask forgiveness for them or do not ask forgiveness for them, even if you ask forgiveness for them 70 times, 
God will not forgive them. That is because they disbelieved in Allah and His Messenger. Allah does not guide the immoral people. And that was the end. Anyone who is a hypocrite that is truly a hypocrite that Prophet ﷺ knew he was and Allah had pointed them out, nobody was allowed to make istighfar them or pray upon them. And such was the end of the hypocrisy in Medina and the land of the Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted to go and do Hajj. This is in the ninth year of Hijrah. But he didn't feel like going to Hajj that year. The reason for that is because he knew that the people of Mecca had still, were still new to Islam. But that's not the reason. People were still learning about Islam. And so there was a bit of Islam and a bit of traditions of old that still had not been gone. So there were men and women doing naked tawaf around the Kaaba. Prophet ﷺ didn't like to go there because they were naked. However, he sent Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to Mecca and said, go and teach them Islam and teach them about their Hajj and teach them about this and teach them about that. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu went there and then when Surah At-Tawbah came down, the Prophet ﷺ thought, who am I going to send to Mecca to teach them Surah At-Tawbah? He sent his cousin Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali radiallahu anhu went there and when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu saw Ali radiallahu anhu, he asked him, Ya Ali, have you come as a command from the Prophet ﷺ to lead in my place, to teach them in my place, or have you come with a particular mission? He said, I have come with a particular mission, and that is to teach the people the verses of Surah At-Tawbah. They were all rules and laws about how to perform, you know, how to live their life in times of war and battle, and about hypocrisy. And about uh, zakat and other things like that. Then Ali radiallahu anhu stood up and he said, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Polytheists, you have four months to leave Arabia. Arabia from this day after four months will become sacred and no two religions can be in Arabia. Because Arabia had become the center of monotheism. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ also said, all previous agreements with the Prophet ﷺ have ended, and now only new agreements happened. The Hajj is done, and the Prophet ﷺ returns to Medina. He didn't go to Hajj, he sent Abu Bakr and Ali, and he was on his way from Hunayn. He goes to Medina, and subhanAllah, what happens? He finds out that his beloved daughter, Umm Kulthum, anha, the wife of Uthman ibn Affan, the one who married two daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reached Medina in an, at the end of the ninth year and finds out that Umm Kulthum radiallahu anha died. She attracted a fever and she died and passed away radiallahu anha. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now has two sons whom he witnessed die in his lifetime and he buried them with his own hands. And three daughters die and he buried them with his own hands. And three wives whom died and he buried them with his own hands. The only one left was Fatima radiallahu anha, al Zahra. The Prophet ﷺ looks at Uthman and hugs him and kisses him on his head and says, Ya Uthman, wallahi, if I had a third daughter for marriage, I would have given her to you. Then, my dear brothers and sisters, in the ninth year and the tenth year and the first month of the eleventh year, something amazing started to happen which Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims had never witnessed before. For the first time, not one or two people are embracing Islam. People are not going out trying their best to teach people Islam. Everybody had already heard about Islam. The whole of Arabia, all the way to Bahrain and Yemen, had heard about Islam. And all the Arabian Peninsula, what's their attitude? Their attitude is, if he truly is a prophet of God as he claims, then God will give him victory over all his enemies and Arabia. Let's listen about it. Let's go to him and ask him a few questions. Wow, this man, truly God has given him victory. Especially that he was almost about to conquer Rome and Persia was on its brink. Tribes after tribes started to send delegates from themselves to the Prophet ﷺ in Masjid al-Nabawi to learn about Islam. And so the way people started to embrace Islam was not in the tens or the dozens, but in the thousands, all at once. The first of them were called Bani Najran. Bani Najran were an Arab Christian tribe made up of 
about 73 towns, 100,000 fighters among them. They're about 100 kilometers away from Medina towards Yemen. And they sent three ministers of theirs, the Minister of Policy and Government, his name was Abdul, Abdul Masih, Minister of Politics and Education, his name was Sharafbir, if you want to know, Minister of Religion and Ethics, his name was Abu Haritha. So they came to the Prophet's Masjid Medina, and what did they do? They entered into the masjid and they used to sleep there and sit there while watching the Muslims pray, and they even prayed their own prayers in the masjid, and the Prophet ﷺ allowed them. And among, among the things they asked the Prophet ﷺ, which bothered them, was they said, okay, if you say that you are a messenger of God, teach us. So we started reciting some Qur'an to them. Now obviously it affected them, but they are not convinced. So they said, Muhammad ﷺ, what do you say about our Lord Jesus Christ? The Prophet ﷺ, he waited for an answer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wanted the best answer. The next day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down from Surah Al-Imran. Surely in the sight of Allah, the similitude of the creation of Isa, of Jesus, is as the creation of Adam, whom he created out of dust. And then he said, be, and he was. This is the truth from your Lord. Be not then among those who doubt. Then Allah said to them, tell whoever disputes with you on this matter, after true knowledge has come to you. Come, let us summon our sons and your sons, and your women and our women, and ourselves and yourselves, and then let us pray together and invoke the curse of Allah on those who lie. This is the true story. There is no God but Allah, and assuredly, Allah is almighty, all wise. Then Allah says, if they turn away from you, O Messenger of God, when you recite these verses to them tomorrow, if they don't like that answer, then say to them a challenge. Say to them, okay, bring yourselves and we'll bring ourselves. You bring your children, we'll bring our children. You bring your women, we'll bring our women. And in front of God, we'll stand and we will say, oh God, curse the ones who are lying. They said, okay. The Prophet ﷺ goes back home. He grabs his grandchildren and Hassan and Hussein and carries them to show them that he is ready and on the truth. And behind him was his daughter Fatima, his own family. And he walks straight into the open and says to them, This is my grandson. This is my daughter. I am ready to invoke the curse upon Allah if I am lying. And you must do the same. When they saw that he was true to it, they got scared. SubhanAllah. And they went and spoke to their minister of religion, Abu Haritha. And he said, listen guys, back off, we might be wrong. Just give them the jizya in exchange for a peace treaty between us. And so the Prophet ﷺ accepted it and there was a kind of allegiance with them. When the peace was established between them and the people of the Christians of Najran, they started to learn about their religion more. And subhanAllah, in only a few weeks, the entire Najran cities, all 72, more than 100,000 men and more women and children, finally embraced Islam, including their ministers. SubhanAllah. Now, another very interesting group came along. There was a group called Bani Hanifa from a place called Yamana. It's about another 100 kilometers away from Medina. Banu Hanifa, another tribe, arrives to the Prophet ﷺ with some delegates. With them was a very interesting man. His name was Musaylama. This man Musaylama was a great poet and respected by his people. When he arrived at the masjid, he, didn't, he refused to enter the masjid. So he stayed outside looking after his people's property. They entered, about 12 of their men, and the Prophet ﷺ asked them if they have a man left outside about Musaylama. He knew about him. So they said, yes, yes, we left him outside to guard our belongings. And listen to what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, well, if you can trust him with your belongings, then he must have a good reputation among you of honesty. Now that, when Musaylama heard about it, he said, huh, the Messenger of God praised me. The Prophet ﷺ had seen a dream a night before. He said, I saw myself that I had been given the entire earth in my possession. 
and two gold bangles were placed in my wrists. I could see them. So he goes, I took them off and I threw them onto the ground in my dream. And Jibreel alayhi salam said to me, these are enemies of yours. Blow unto them. And they faded away. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he knew that there were going to be two men who were going to rise, who will claim that they are prophets, that they are liars and they will be the enemies of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in his lifetime. And he was waiting for them. Then he said, call Musaylama in. I want to talk to him. When they went to call him, he said, I'll only come in and accept Islam if Muhammad gives us the rule after him. When he said that, the Prophet ﷺ immediately knew he was one of those gold bangles in the dream. The Prophet ﷺ picked himself up. He would not settle to just send news. He has to take care of this and announce it because this is a detriment of the Ummah. To say, I'm a prophet, the Prophet ﷺ got up and he took with him one of the Sahabas and he stood up in front of everyone and said, what is this that I hear? Musaylama said, Ya Muhammad, if you give us the amr, if you give us the rule after you, then I will embrace Islam. The Prophet ﷺ became extremely angry and picked up a straw from the ground and said, Wallahi ya Musaylama, if you were to ask me for this straw, I will not give it to you. And Wallahi, I do not see you except you are the interpretation of my dream, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to destroy. Musaylama then frowned, turned away with a smile, and walked away. Musaylama goes back to Yamama, and there are people who had embraced Islam, and he begins to conspire and teach people with this manipulative way. As I said, he was a very good talker, he knew how to talk and poetry, and he started to convince the people that he is a prophet. God has given me revelation, and I am a partner with Muhammad, the messenger of God, I am also a messenger of God. He admitted that Muhammad is a messenger of God, but he also said, you have to believe that I am a messenger of God too. And so the people of Yamama began to apostate, leave Islam and follow Musaylama. Why? Because it's an act of pride. Our people, they want the kingdom, they want the wealth. They know that Muhammad Islam is going to reach the world and they want they want it all for themselves. So they go, wow, a prophet from our tribe? That will be amazing. We will rule the world. So Musaylama goes and writes a letter with all this audacity. He writes a letter to Muhammad sallallahu a few months later. And this is where he writes in the letter, Musaylama. He says, from Musaylama, the messenger of God, to Muhammad, the messenger of God. You and I are partners in this message. So, you, so let Quraysh have half and let us have the other half of the rule of the world. Prophet looks at those messengers and says, What do you say about me? Do you believe I am the messenger of God? They said, We believe and bear witness that Musaylam is the messenger of God. So they took the Prophet and wrote a letter, and in his letter he wrote, From Muhammad the messenger of Allah to Musaylam the liar. He said to him, no, you will not inherit the kingdom or rule after me. This earth belongs to Allah. He is the only one who decides who will take it. And the end triumph is for those who fear God. When Musaylama received that letter, he just laughed at it. And he kept going with his people. So his people began to doubt him. So what did they say? They said, Musaylama, look man, you're respected. We love you. Remember, they're lying. You know... Muhammad, the messenger of God, the other one, he revealed some verses that came down from the heavens and he read them upon us and we heard them. Have you got verses that we can hear them in? As so we can show everyone else, you know, because... Mm -hmm. So he looks at them and goes, yes, of course. They go, tell us. He goes, Muhammad, Rasulullah, brought a surah about the elephant. Al-Feed. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-Feed. أَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ كَيْدَهُمْ فِي تَضْلِيلٍ وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلٍ تَرْمِيهِمْ بِحِجَارَةٍ مِّنْ سِجِّيلٍ فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَعَصْفٍ مَأْكُولٍ They go beautiful. I also received revelation about the elephant. He goes, tell us. So he goes, الْفِيلُ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مِ الْفِيلُ لَهُ خُرْتُومٌ طَوِيلُ وَذَيْلٌ أَثِيلُ The elephant. And what would explain the elephant to you? He has a long trunk and a short tail. They looked at him and all laughed and they go to him, <laughs> May Allah make your face hideous. 
When Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam came with verses, you know, that Allah could be on human ability, and all you could mention is his trunk and his tail. They said to him, "We know that you are a liar." What can but a lying prophet from our people is better for us. We'll we'll accept that than a truthful prophet from the people of Quraysh. Pathetic. Anyway, my brothers and sisters in Islam, this man Musaylama, he died one year, one year after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's death. At the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, and it was quite interesting, the man who killed him was Wahshi. Wahshi was the one who killed Hamza radiallahu anhu, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's uncle. And you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wouldn't look at Wahshi's face when he became a Muslim. Even after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's death, everybody kind of looked at Wahshi funny. So Wahshi said to himself, I will earn my love from Allah and his messenger and I will not rest until I have killed with you the most hated man to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to make up. And after that Wahshi became honorable till the end of time. We'll move on to just a few more incidents, another, some other groups that came in. There was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Jarir. He was from Yemen. He was one of their leaders. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on the minbar. Suddenly, as Abdullah ibn Jarir enters the masjid, Everybody goes quiet and they just stare at him. And the Prophet is standing at the minbar, he's looking at Abdullah al-Jarir and he's smiling to him. So he turns around to the companion and says, Has the Prophet said something about me that you guys are all silent? He said, Yeah. The Prophet just told us today, a man is about to enter the masjid who is the most Beloved to Allah, or the best man to Allah in all of Yemen. And we were waiting to see who that man is. And it was you, Ya Abdullah ibn Jalil. And the Prophet ﷺ, after the member climbed down, hugged him and kissed him, says, How am I so happy to meet you, Ya Abdullah, the best man of people of Yemen whom Allah chose? He says, Ya Rasulullah, thank you. I have a little problem. He goes, Because I'm so tall, I can't stabilize myself on the horse. Can you make dua for me to stabilize myself? Prophet ﷺ said, may Allah make you stable in your heart and your body and on your horse. And he never fell off his horse after that day. So that's the little story of Abdullah ibn Jarir. And so, my brothers and sisters, all these large groups started coming in, in the thousands, after thousands, in the ninth and the tenth year, until the last group to come in was in the middle of Muharram, in the eleventh year. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the verse of the Qur'an, when the victory of your Lord comes to you, and the opening. The opening of Mecca that is. And when you start seeing the people enter Islam in large groups after large groups, glorifying in praise of your Lord and ask Him to forgive you. Verily, He is the one who 